Welcome, everybody, to uh, what I know is going to be a, uh, a really fascinating uh, 45 minutes or so um, uh, as we talk of not just the challenges uh, we currently face with, within the patient safety environment, um, but also uh, the actions that we believe are really important uh, to consider um, and, and set that in the context of we've known for a long time uh, what needs to be done. Um, and why is it so difficult uh, for us to find the ways to do it? Now, our conversation this after, or conversation today is going to be uh, with four truly, uh, sorry, three, I have to edit that out, sorry, three truly global figures uh, in the world of, of, of patient safety. Um, and in no particular order, uh, I'm just going to uh, use the, uh, the screen in front of me to introduce, first of all, uh, Sir Liam Donaldson. Uh, Liam uh, has been a, a figure of outstanding uh, character in the world of patient safety over uh, decades. Uh, I won't say how many, because that will tell you how old he is, but, um, <laughs> but uh, of, for many decades, and certainly was at the earliest stages in recognizing the importance, not just of a, appropriate methods of governance, of clinical governance uh, in healthcare, but also of that vital, the vital role of the patient and their family in being able to talk of their experience and being able to share their experience uh, with, uh, with others. Um, so welcome, Liam, uh, and uh, I know it's going to be a, a, a great conversation that we have with you today. Um, we're also joined by, by Jeremy Hunt, uh, Jeremy Hunt, uh, as many of you know, uh, was the longest uh, serving Secretary of State for Health um, for the uh, NHS in the UK Health Service um, and uh, for the UK government. But as also uh, he's held Secretary of State positions in other ministries and governments and, uh, and in particular uh, in the Foreign Office as, as Foreign Secretary. And, and that may be, be relevant to us, I think, uh, as we discuss about the importance of a, a global movement. Uh, for improving patient safety. And Jeremy has now spent many years, not just in his own work as a, as a minister and now as Secretary of the Health and Social Care Select Committee, but also in, in learning himself of, of the importance of safety, but also some of the elements that we need to introduce across our societies and our countries. And thirdly, uh, uh, to everyone in the audience for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, Joe Chiani, uh, who is the, the founder of the Patient Safety Movement um, uh, Foundation uh, and through his, his uh, corporation Massimo and the foundation being that, that, that touchstone, that, that group who has kept the movement going, who has continued to stimulate it, uh, who created the concept of, of reducing harm to zero um, and maintaining the importance of our drive uh, to do that. Uh, and that's created issues for many. Uh, in fact, the challenge to, to reduce to zero in itself uh, is something that, uh, that people will often want to talk about. So I know that we're going to have a great conversation uh, from the three uh, in the room. And I, I hope I will be talking very little uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So um, let's go back to the to the to as what we'd say in, in the UK, the batting order. Um, um, and. Uh, Liam, as, as the sort of the longest serving um, patient safety expert, I think probably in the room uh, today, you've seen the challenges emerge over the last uh, two or three decades um, and the actions that are put in place. But now in your role as the WHA envoy and, and leading work on both the action plan for the next decade, but also on many other different elements, what, what do you think are the, the current challenges and, and, and a couple of actions that you think would be important to introduce? Well, Mike, when I started um, on this journey, I was chief medical officer in the UK and um, we produced a report around the same time as the Institute of Medicine's To Our Is Human report. And we called our report in the UK an organization with a memory. And at that time, um, very, very few people were involved in uh, championing the need for safer care. Safety was seen as fire risks or hazards of tripping up on a, uh, on a loose floor tile, things of that sort. 
And when safety came in, it tended to be referred to as medical error. And um, that term became increasingly outmoded as we started to talk to the people in other fields like aviation who have achieved great improvements in safety, but by concentrating not just on the individual error in isolation, but on systems and the way in which systems make it easier for people to make errors and mistakes. And also when those mistakes happen in a weak system, the impact is much higher. Somebody might die or be seriously harmed. So when we started, it was a domain of interest of a very small number of people. And then the number of enthusiasts grew and the number of passionate leaders grew and the number of researchers grew. But my question always, even when I'm talking to audiences today, is how much do you think um, patient safety as a, a way of clinical life has penetrated the mainstream? Is it 5%, 10%, 50%, 100%? And most people put their hands up in the audience and they suggest maybe 15, 20% of clinicians and others are practicing uh, uh, and following the philosophy and the concepts of patient safety. So my big challenge uh, for, ev for everybody in health systems around the world, I think, is how do we get better at moving from that minority of enthusiasts and champions to the majority? So it's, it's in an old cliche, everybody's business. Patient safety is everybody's business. Thanks, Liam. Thanks. Uh, that, that, that will be the challenge, isn't it? And we often hear, hear um, Don Berwick in particular talk about um, uh, workers getting, getting it as work as to be done uh, and uh, the need to recognise that, uh, that this is, as you said, a way of life uh, and not something to just be added on to. Um, Jeremy, you've, you've, you've borne the brunt of, of many challenges to, to uh, some of the cha changes that you wanted to bring about to improve the safety of patients uh, uh, in the UK system. But and now you're working closely with, with, with Liam, I know, and with WHO colleagues uh, to look at uh, more of a global picture. What, what's, what's your views on the last, particularly your interests over the last 10 to 15 years? I think the first thing to say is that, you know, we shouldn't beat ourselves up um, and, and say that we haven't made progress, because I think there has been massive progress. Um, I mean, you can go back to the um, hand-washing campaigns that Liam did a huge amount to uh, get going at the World Health Organization when he was Chief Medical Officer, which was the start of much more focus on patient safety around the world. Uh, you can look at areas where we had specific focus in England, for example, on maternity safety, where even though we had a very um, depressing uh, report published a few weeks back as to some things that happened at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital, over the last decade, we've seen a 36% reduction in neonatal death rates, a 25% reduction in stillbirths. And, you know, these are very solid figures, and this is very solid progress in the right direction. And I would say that culturally, um, we, we're halfway there, we're not more. We, we now, I think it's, it's now quite normal in healthcare to talk about the dangers of a blame culture and how important it is to support, support clinicians to speak openly and transparently when things go wrong, the, the things that Liam was just talking about. Whereas I think, you know, if I think exactly 10 years ago when I became health secretary, there were still a lot of people who felt that if there was a problem in the NHS, it was dangerous to talk about it publicly because it would damage confidence in the service. And I don't think people say that now. And I think people recognize the importance of openness and transparency. So I think we have made progress. I think our challenge is the pandemic has really set things back in lots of ways. Um, you know, in I'm just gonna be parochial now and talk about what's happening in, in England, but we have 6.2 million people waiting for treatment, uh, 19,000 people waiting more than a year for treatment, 6,000 people waiting more than two years for treatment. And the risk you have with those kinds of volumes is that we go back into seeing 
healthcare is a numbers game and we, we start thinking about statistics and not people. And then the patient safety corners get cut and you start to see all the risks emerging uh, that we know about only too well. And so I think there's a real risk that uh, as politicians focus on targets to get this backlog down before an election, that some of the important lessons that we learned about safety and quality are unlearned. So what would I say are the, the three things that we need to, to think about? I, I would say that going forward, globally, there is a massive issue about workforce. I mean, the United States needs a million more nurses. Germany wants 300,000 more nurses. Uh, we need another 4,000 doctors just to deal with a backlog. But globally, the WHO say there's a shortage of 2.1 million doctors. And the normal thing of just importing doctors from other countries when you need them is now stretching the bounds of what is being ethical. I mean, we have more than 300 NHS employees in England from Somalia, and I'm sure they do a brilliant job. But you have to ask yourself whether it is justifiable ethically for the UK to be importing doctors and nurses from a country like Somalia that needs them so desperately. And so we have got to start tooling up our system, start training more doctors, training more nurses, finding ways to dramatically increase, because this demand with advances in technology and medicine is, is only going to increase. And then I think the next big really radical change is technology and this is going to have a massive impact in helping the patient safety agenda and helping the transparency that underlines uh, many of the reforms that we've all championed and I think some real thinking about how we could use the tech revolution to transform the safety of care delivered um, is, is really our next big step. Thanks Jeremy. So, so three three key areas to, to work with. And then um, and, and the sitting in the chair next to you, certainly in my screen, um, we've, got, we've got someone who leads a big technology revolution uh, and has led it for, for a while now. Um, but you've also got some other thoughts, I think, Joe, in terms of uh, the other element that, that you mentioned about how do we incentivize the system uh, to do what Liam said, which is to have this as, a, as our way of life. Um, so that uh, there is there is no alternative, and I'm just wondering, Joe, what what you're look, particularly interested in your on your views are about technology and, and how that will help us, but also what about this issue about uh, how do we incentivize systems uh, to do better? Thank you, thank you so much, Mike. Um, first of all, on the technology side, uh, computers can do things so some things much better than human, and human can do something much better than computers. One thing computers can do a really good job at is keeping track of things like trends, like uh, historical data. So, and with the advent of all of these cameras and sensors and biosensors, uh, tools like artificial intelligence or expert systems can be really effective in turning a one sigma clinician in detecting a problem to a six sigma clinician detecting a problem. So one of the challenges though to create those tools has been a lack of cooperation by my peers uh, in the medtech company. And in, at some point it was me as well, where we were hoarding our data, the same data that we were, that were being purchased, uh, pulse oximeter values, uh, radiology information, the companies that made these machines wouldn't share that data with other people that could take all of that data aggregate them and make some sense about what could happen in the future based on the past. Uh, the trend data is incredibly informative that human beings are hard to look at for them, but it's easy for computers to look at, but you need access to that data. So one of the things that we tried to do with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is to remove that barrier. One of the commitments we asked for for med tech companies was to share the data that their products were purchased for so that eventually it, a new ecosystem is created for developers to create those predictive algorithms. And uh, I'm happy to say over 90 companies 
uh, signed that pledge, including giants like Oracle, who now owns Cerner, as well as GE, Philips, and of course, Massimo. Uh, but, but, you know, to take a maybe step back to talk about the second question about this aligned incentives uh, concept that we talk a lot about at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, um, I want to just step back for a moment, if I may, to kind of tell you what I think has been the critical milestones in this journey of patient safety and why I think if we want to keep it going, we need certain things that are hopefully will be self-governing and kind of the perpetual machine, if you will. So I think a key milestone was that to air as human report by IOM. I think another key milestone was Dr. Peter Pronovo's checklist on CLAPSI that showed if you did put the evidence-based systems in place, you could get incredibly better results. Uh, another incredible milestone was uh, what Jeremy Hunt did with the ministerial summit on patient safety. And, uh, and of course, what you guys did at NHS together, the transparency movement that has already paid uh, handsomely. And of course, I think President Clinton's CGI initiative taught us something that you can create a commitment-based organization. You know, the price of the showing up to a meeting isn't just what you paid for the meeting, but a willingness to commit to doing something to help. So putting all that together, we created this uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And I think maybe what we brought forward besides all of those lessons was a unification message that whether you're a med tech company like mine or a hospital or patient, very important patient advocate or uh, in the government, uh, we needed to work together to solve the rest of the problems, which takes me back to the commitments we asked for. We asked for hospitals to commit to zero. We asked med tech companies to share their data and universities to begin making patient safety part of their curriculum. And where we haven't yet achieved our objective are three ideas. One is love, bringing love to the patient, not being afraid to love your patient and that you get too emotionally involved. Some people think it's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. And then transparency, which you got in the UK, but we don't have in the rest of the world and aligned incentives, which is, sorry, a long way to come back to what you asked me to begin with. The aligned incentives idea is very simple. Whether no country that I know of is 100% private. Some of them are 100% public. Most of them are half and half, like my country here in the US. So given that the government is paying for some of this care, if not all of it, I think we could put together something that will be self-governing and self-propelling. And that is to pay hospitals, even when they make mistakes, if they put the processes in place to avoid that mistake, that medical error, and not pay them for anything when somebody gets hurt or dies when they haven't put that processes in place. I think something like that could have a huge impact and get us over this chasm of the choir doing the work, but not everybody else in the church. Okay, thanks, Joe, thank you. So I'm, I'm looking to my, my colleagues, no one's interrupting you. So, so that means that they're, they're, they're listening. I didn't breathe, that's why. <laughs> and I'm happy what you're saying. Um, so, um, any any thoughts on 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 the, the from the three of you on what each other has said um, about a sense of a sense of purpose and direction in this in this field now? Then, I'm I'm particularly interested in. So we we also sorry I'm particularly interested in the work that we're not doing uh, and the settings that we're not particularly looking at. So we spend a lot of time looking at our hospitals. We spend a lot of time looking at within the processes within our hospitals to improve. M majority of our patients are not in hospital. Uh, majority of our patients are carrying long-term conditions with them, having multiple, multiple meds uh, on them. Most of them, a lot of them have uh, concurrent issues with their mental health, uh, with their physical health. I'm just wondering, uh, where are we in terms of this debate about challenge for both in terms of the vulnerable groups, the hard to reach groups, but those that are, haven't been really looked at closely in terms of the safety agenda? Uh, and are we doing enough on that area? 
Liam, sorry. Yeah, yeah Mike, I, you asked me to react to other others' yeah. comments, yeah. and I'll pick up I'll pick up Joe's comments straight away because he raised something very important. This question of data. And I remember being asked to look around a, a hospital in England where they'd installed um, automated monitoring system so the nurses didn't have to do the observations. And it, two things struck me. First of all, the nurses loved it uh, and they didn't have to be data literate. The output was such that they could easily understand what was happening to their patients. But when I said to the uh, um, CEO of the company who was demonstrating, I said to him, you must have millions of data points here. You must be able to, to look at these patients and predict from the data which patients were likely to deteriorate. And we know very well that about a, a fifth of the avoidable deaths in hospital are caused by one reason or another, people not spotting deterioration in an acutely ill patient, whether it's sepsis or whatever it, causation it is, they are acutely ill, they're getting worse, um, the nurses are busy, they miss out observations, the, the charts get lost, and one way or another, the patient isn't rescued in the terminology that tends to be used. So I just wonder why we can't, um, people could call it big data, but why we can't get these large number of data points assembled and analyzed and, uh, and used to be able to intervene upstream to prevent people from suffering harm or death. Yeah. Thanks, Liam. Um, and, and so I would naturally, sorry, Joe, I, I would naturally then transfer that, that debate into um, learning from uh, across the, last, the re recent years in the pandemic to, to those exactly those points and data points uh, out of hospitals as well. Um, so where we can learn, learn for earlier intervention. Um, both for the recovering patient, but also the ones that haven't been able to get into hospital in the first place. Sorry, Joe, I, I cut across you. Well, I, I I totally believe what Liam is saying, and I and I believe, hopefully, if not sooner, in a decade, we will be there. Uh, we've had, we've suffered from lack of connected devices, uh, and electronic medical records being just billing machines, not being really electronic clinical records. And I think that's all changing. And I think you know, companies like Massimo were looking at sepsis algorithms uh, by coalescing all the data, not just SpO2 and pulse rate, but temperature, respiration rate, and other information from the lab, including going back to even the phenotype of the person and their historical data so that we can help predict those problems. And I think many other companies are gonna have that. And I think part of, the opening to do that has been this willingness to share data that we began about a decade ago that I think will pay off uh, incredibly well in the future. Okay, thanks. Jeremy, I can see you nodding, but also itching to get in here. Thanks. I just feel that, um, you know, all of us um, have been passionate patient safety advocates because we feel that there's a particular horror in um, medical error that means that someone dies or is harmed in a way that was completely unnecessary. So what the public tend to think about with medicine is a disease for which there's no cure. Uh, someone dying because they have a brain tumor and there's nothing you can do about it. But uh, what we all uncovered in our uh, contact with medical, uh, with the medical world or in our medical careers is, is this horror which the public aren't really aware of, is, which is the extraordinary amount of avoidable harm and death. But I feel that to make sure that patient safety remains mainstream, we need to think more in the way that Joe's talking about, about how we can make ourselves part of the future because um, one of the problems is that people are looking at advances in medicine and they're saying, well, look, I, I understand what you're saying about avoidable harm and death, but we're just gonna make a few uh, advances in terms of our ability to interpret genomes 
and we're going to be able to save millions of lives just like that. So shouldn't we really be putting our effort into to these things? And I think um, particularly the prevention agenda is one that people are really thinking very, very hard about. And I think from a patient safety point of view, we need to be really embracing prevention as the ultimate uh, safety for patients. If you, if you give someone uh, care that means that they don't get ill in the first place, I mean, that is, that is the safest care you could possibly give them. And I just think that there are many, many ways that that is gonna happen. So in technology, for example, I think it's quite interesting to think about how we are going to move to a world in which people's decoded genomes sit on their medical records in a form that a doctor looking at that medical record can interpret easily and then can talk to people about their genetic predispositions. And so um, I don't want to move away from our core purpose, which is to eliminate medical error. And um, indeed, I've written a book on it, which uh, all of you three gentlemen figure in. Um, and um, the title of the book is Zero. So I've been very inspired by what uh, Joe's, Joe's big campaign of getting to zero by 2020, which sadly we didn't quite get to, but it was a brilliant ambition. And I wrote a whole chapter about saying why we should get to zero, but I just feel that we need to find a way to embrace tech and the tech revolution in in our patient safety movement, because I think that's what is getting a lot of attention. Okay, thanks, Jeremy, thank you. Joe, open arms for that conversation. Open arms, I, I love the title of your book. I can't wait to read it, Jeremy. And I, and I hopefully it'll inspire a lot more people going back to Liam's comment earlier that 15 to 20% of the people know about patient safety. Hopefully your book will get us a lot further because it will take the whole village, sorry for using that too often, to solve this problem. We all have to do it. Uh, I, I think Jeremy is spot on. I think, you know, of course, I have an engineering degree. And so, you know, what do they say? Every, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. But yes, I think technology will play a huge role in preventing problems, uh, hopefully fixing things at home. So you rarely have to go to hospitals and doctors and they're not as overwhelmed. They have more time to give you the care you really need instead of wasting time with things that they don't need to do. And also helping with the prediction. And, uh, you know, Jeremy said it right now with cancer, with genetic uh, sequencing, people that can afford it get the right therapy. Uh, there are 600 types of cancers, not just a few. And to know which one you have can really uh, dictate uh, the best course of action. So the future does look bright, but we can't just let it happen accidentally. We've got to together push it there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Liam, you, um, I want to, I'm sure you're going to say something about something, but I also want you to, to think about the, reflecting on, particularly with regard to your role within the WHO um, and some of those areas, some of the, the systems and nations and states that maybe not as as fortunate uh, as, as others. How 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 are we going to be supporting supporting them? Because uh, unless we do that, uh, then I think we're we're not going to tip the balance in terms of the global impact. Uh, I'll I'll say something briefly yeah. about that, Mike. Before I do, I just wanted to also comment on um, things that I've seen Jeremy doing, and also. Joe, and in a, in a modest way, I hope myself as well, which is to recognize the power of the granularity of the patient experience. And when I went to uh, Joe's conference in, in California and watched the number of patients who'd been victims of harm who were part of his conference, it had an incredible impact, not just on me, but everybody there. And Jeremy has done so much in not, I can't imagine any other health secretary in history that has met patients who've suffered harm and talked to them and understood their experience and then communicated it to others. And I've watched with the WHO Patients for Patient Safety Programme, I've watched audiences in tears, uh, seasoned doctors and nurses listening to the patient's story. Now, you can't measure that 
but there's something about getting to the heart. Joe talked about love and the heart is, as one patient told me, where you love from. And I think that connection between the granularity of the patient's experience and the big strategic picture where we're trying to push uh, major change is very important. On the um, situation of, of the low-income countries, I think the, the key link there with avoidable harm is basically to access to care. And the big goal of the WHO and, and many other global health agencies is universal health coverage. That doesn't mean everybody gets health care free, but it means that nobody is denied care who needs it for their health and well-being, or um, nobody is financially ruined because they fall ill. And that goal of universal health coverage, as Jeremy said earlier, we have to embed our patient safety ideals into that bigger ideal of providing universal health coverage for, for everyone. But certainly lack of access to care in, um, in the large slices of the world is the biggest cause of avoidable harm. I've also got hopes that, that um, through the WHO in its convening role, we'll be able to accelerate the process of the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, which is a, a, a key uh, formula for setting out almost a decade of work. Um, uh, do you want to say anything about that? Because I think that's, that's going to be a, for a number of countries that don't necessarily have access to politicians and leaders such as you three, um, uh, it gives them a frame too uh, within which to try and work to create that appropriate environment. Yeah, and a, a lot of people were involved in that from countries around the world, experts. So there's a lot of buy-in, but also a lot of ownership because so many people played a part in, in producing it. So I think um, what I found in working with WHO over many, many years now, in general, the high-income countries feel they can do without WHO's advice, but within the middle-income world and the and the low-income countries, um, they are very, very um, grateful for guidance and help and support, and in, on the whole, uh, tend to value plans like this, and they act as a big guide for them going forward, and I think that's what will happen with this Global Safe, Patient Safety Action Plan. Yeah. Well, one thing okay. I would like to add to what Liam said is, you know, the same way a lot of those lower resource countries went from no telephone directly to the cell phone. If we could get these lower resource countries where they're going from no access to care to hopefully access to care that has patient safety uh, in it to begin with, uh, instilled in it. Uh, and what I'm talking about is there are about what I call 30 to 40 standard operating procedures that if you put in place, then human errors, which we all make, don't have to lead to medical errors. And most hospitals around the world don't have them all. Some have some of them, but boy, wouldn't it be a great opportunity from day one as they create their healthcare systems to, uh, to hardwire that patient safety in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating you should talk about operating procedures, cause, um, Joe, because I was uh, party to a conversation uh, yesterday with a hospital that is struggling uh, with um, what we have in, in the UK called Never Events. Um, and, and one of the elements that they uh, introduced, which uh, has reduced uh, their number dramatically, is uh, is what we over here called LOCSIX or, or local um, uh, uh, operating procedures. Uh, and when Jeremy was Secretary of State, he, he introduced a system of uh, national operating procedures and also those that would be adapted locally. Um, um, and they are starting to influence. It's very interesting how, how some, but some hospitals doing it, other hospitals not doing it. So it's this variability, I, I think, in implementation uh, that is, is currently uh, not helping our patients, but also significantly not helping our healthcare workers, our staff, uh, who are also uh, implicated uh, so often without reason, actually, uh, uh, in the errors that are being made. Jeremy, you mentioned the issue of, of um, culture and, and healthcare and uh, healthcare workers and 
uh, often the, the, the system uh, is being the issue rather than the individual. Have you got any more thoughts about this? Because you've reflected on it. Yeah, I, I would just say that, um, you know, as we sort of think about things that are changing in healthcare, so whether it's genomics or technology or the aftershock of the pandemic, um, I think it's really important that we don't forget the central goal, which our campaigning has started to move things towards, uh, but which there's a lot more work to do, which is that in the airline industry, they managed to create uh, extremely high safety levels by putting in place systems where mistakes were learnt from quickly. And they managed to stamp out, largely stamp out a blame culture. And we haven't done that yet in medicine, but the goal would be so huge for patients if we had a culture in which we self-corrected, where everywhere, in any hospital, anywhere in the world, when there were mistakes, instead of people asking which doctor or nurse is to blame, people said, what went wrong and how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? Now that, is a very, very much harder thing to do in medicine because when people die, people naturally want to look for a person who is responsible and attach blame. It's just, it, it's understandable. Whereas in the airline industry, most of the time in those situations, you're dealing with near misses. So it's, um, it's more straightforward to say, we're not gonna blame anyone uh, when you have an, as we saw, and I'm sure you've all seen the film Sully, but when you, when you end up with uh, near misses that are dramatic, there's still an overwhelming urge to try and find someone guilty, even in the airline industry. But I think that is a very big goal, which we should carry on aiming for, because I think that would be, as we move into the tech revolution, the genomics revolution, there are still gonna be all these errors. There are still gonna be mistakes. There'll be different types of mistakes, but doctors, nurses, midwives are still gonna get things wrong. And if we could, learn that lesson from the airline industry, the oil industry, the nuclear industry about creating a positive learning environment where people aren't penalized for speaking openly and transparently. I, I feel that is really as much worth aiming for now as it ever was. Thank you. I, I love that. And by yeah. the way, something terrible has happened in the US. A nurse in Tennessee who made an error has been prosecuted criminally. And when, when you do that, the learning culture goes away. It stops mm. people from wanting to report problems and learn from problems. And uh, I believe as I've looked into that problem at that hospital, there was a system failure that unfortunately her human error ended up becoming a medical error. But to criminalize people is, is a terrible, terrible thing. And we gotta, we gotta do something about that. Yeah. Liam, thoughts on candor then? Nice, easy question for you. How, how can we have true candor and, and at the same time protect our protect individuals like the nurse in, in Tennessee? Well, I think it links back to what Jeremy um, was saying about the blame culture. You, you can't have candor if the result of surfacing something is likely to lead to you being disciplined or punished or or have a stain on your career so that you don't progress your career anymore. Um, but we have to do more simply than um, admit the error and apologize. I think you have to then work with patients and families um, to show them that we're learning and we need them to help us. And there will always be uh, bitterness and anger and grief at the beginning. But what I've found is that many families who've lost a loved one due to um, of some sort of harm, avoidable harm, um, if they're given time and listened to and respected, they will often want to help. And I remember vividly one occasion talking to a, a mother who'd lost a child and the hospital had, had fallen over themselves trying to express apologies and remorse. And in the end, they came up, she told me, with a big idea. They were going to uh, plant a tree in the hospital garden. And she said to them, 
I don't want you to plant a tree. I don't want you to put a plaque up on the wall in memory of my son. I want you to commit to learning so that this never happens to anyone else. And that's what most patients do. So I think we, we don't just, we're not just open about what happened. We don't just apologize, but we say to them, if, you, if you're able to help, if you're willing to help, will you help us to turn this round and produce a sustainable, permanent uh, elimination of this form of harm? Thank you, Liam. Thank you. That was a great opportunity from that, that, that family uh, and that mother. Um, we're coming to the end of our, our, our period of time, so, but I just want to give you all a chance to reflect um, uh, on a couple of things. But one, uh, Jeremy, you mentioned that uh, despite our, um, uh, the efforts that have been made that, and our concern that more needs to be done, a lot has been done. Um, so we should be quite positive about some of the influences and the changes that have taken place um, for us by in every setting uh, and uh, certainly in terms of the global impact on, on safety. With And I'm just wondering whether each of you could think about what you think it would be uh, your positive message uh, about uh our safety agenda and our positive message about our future with regard to how we take uh, this ongoing uh, commitment forward. Shall I start? Well, you're the practice politician, Jeremy, so I'm sure you've got, uh, you can do this. I want to get do this for, for Lee to steal my points. Um, so um, <laughs> I, I just, you know, I think the first thing to say is that and I'd be very interested to know if Liam agrees with me on this um, as a clinician, but I do believe that healthcare is getting safer. I, I think that, you know, if you look at the direction of travel compared to, you know, 20 years ago, I think that overall, despite all the pressures we have and even coping with the pandemic, I think healthcare is actually getting safer. We it's sometimes two steps forward, one step back, but I think it's, getting safer and I think that we should always remember that culture change is sometimes painfully slow but it's worth aiming for because in the end the only permanent change is culture change and that's the only change that is ever really embedded and I think that culture change is beginning to happen. Um, so I, I am personally um, optimistic. I think that there's been a lot of progress that's been made. I think there are lots of challenges. Um, I just want to give a plug for um, my own um, uh, charity in the UK, Patient Safety Watch, because what we're doing is something very simple with Aradazi and his team at Imperial, and, and Joe's giving us some support in, in doing this. But we're doing something very simple. We've commissioned Imperial to do two things. Um, and they are going to do this every other year. So one year, they are just going to publish what they estimate is the total number of avoidable deaths in the NHS in England and where they stand and where the most effort should be made in order to reduce avoidable deaths. So we will have in one place an authoritative study that quantifies the level of avoidable death. And I think that will be a very important addition to the debate because it will be something with impeccable academic credentials that allows us to get our head around the size of the problem and whether it's getting better or worse. And then in the other year, so that they'll do one year, in the other year they're going to publish a global patient safety ranking which ranks all the countries of the world by the safety of their healthcare system. And that will get us all discussing which of the countries we need to learn from. Is there some innovation in Sweden or Japan or Switzerland that we could be learning from? And, um, and I think that will also create helpful debate. So I think all these things I hope will make a contribution, but I think this is a time for renewing our effort and our, our renewing our ambition. Thanks, Jeremy, thank you. Um, uh, and no doubt we'll see some fantastic results from, from uh, Patient Safety Watch. Uh, Liam. Well, in one of my new roles as chairman of a new health body in the northeast of England, 
Um, I'm going to see whether all of my rhetoric over the years can be put into practice. And um, one of the things I just want to leave you with one thought, I think I've, we've all read and talked and spoken and listened about uh, all aspects of patient safety over the years. And, but there'll be a few things that stick in our minds. And one of mine is the, the book by um, Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe called Managing the Unexpected. It's about high reliability organizations. And they, they, um, out, they list the criteria of high reliability organizations. And there's one of those criteria that I really love. And it chimes with what Jeremy said about aviation. The thing about aviation is <clears throat> they now have so few accidents that they've so so well what how are we going to learn there's no accidents to learn from and basically um this criterion of um wyke and sutcliffe um answers that question they say a high reliability organization should make a strong response to a weak signal of failure and to me, that's a gold standard. As I visit all the hospitals in, in my region in this new role, I'm going to ask them, show me an example of where a weak signal that there may be a risk somewhere in the system, you've pounced on it and dealt with it and put in place the action necessary. Because to me, that's the test. How far upstream are you anticipating and preventing? Great. Thanks, Liam. And, and I, the reason I was turning around was because I was looking for the book, uh, which I happen to have. I don't know if you can see it on there. <laughs> hey, Jeremy, where's your book? Uh, what about it? But it is it. But no, for everyone who's listening, uh, not it's, printed uh, yet. I'm afraid. Not print, okay. <laughs> Only a few for weeks. Who's listening, but Kathleen Sutcliffe's book is very. It's a very good uh, and Carl White's very good. Uh, so thank thank you, Liam. But also good luck in the good luck in the north, as they say. Um, uh, uh, over the next uh, next period, um, uh, Joe, um, what positive messages have you got for us uh, in terms of our, our sense of, of purpose, direction? And I really uh, do embrace what you talked about, love. And I know that a uh, great hero of mine, Avedis Don Avedian, always talked about that as being a key a key part of uh, of any system made up of individuals and individual processes that. It was the it was the ethical values of the individuals that were held within that system that really made the difference, and uh, and he purported love was being absolutely key to that. So, what are your positive messages for us? Well, I, I definitely have one, uh, but before I go there, uh, I love what Liam said. It's that jumping really excessively to a small signal is key. If that's part of an amazing culture, and I see. At, at a hospital I'm involved with, and they're amazing. And of course, what, uh, what I really think, Jeremy, the reason you can do what you're doing in England is because of that transparency law that you created. So kudos to you. I hope many more countries will follow it because once the data is there, you can learn from it. Um, and nobody wants to be last. <laughs> so it creates a nice competition for the, for the right things. Um, one thing, a thing that I know, uh, Mike, you're aware of, many of us here are aware of, WHO is, has been working on a paper um, that unfortunately reports that patient safety got hurt a lot during COVID. Um, pretty much everything doubled or even got worse uh, on all fronts of patient safety. And, I, and maybe it's because of uh, my own bias, but I think what probably was the biggest difference between before COVID and after and during COVID was the lack of families being allowed in to be advocates for their loved ones. And, you know, until we all learn to love strangers, there is somebody who loves that stranger. It's their family. And that person also can be a, an extra help for the lack of nursing and doctor shortages without the skills. But, you know, wasn't it Plato who said the best doctor is one who gets sick a lot? Well, families know their loved ones. And I think we can do a lot better learning from that lack of family and embracing them in our hospitals to be advocates for their loved ones. But I'll leave you with a great, great, uh, hopeful uh, result. Uh, so Liam, I hope uh, the challenge is on that you get the same result I did, 
in a smaller place. Children's Hospital of Orange County. I joined the quality committee several years ago and I'm on the, a member of board of the directors and SHOCK implemented every standard operating procedure we know of. We call them apps. By the way, they're on the Patient Safety Movement Foundation website. And they also, before they implemented them, they decided to tie the bonus of the faculty, a third of it, to zero. If we achieve zero at the end of the year, you get a third of your bonus. If you don't, you don't. Once they did that, the hospital already had a wonderful culture, but they went through all the apps, the procedures, marked green, the parts they were doing, yellow and red, what they weren't doing, with a mitigation plan to get them to green. And in the first year, they didn't get to zero. And to their credit, they didn't say, this is ridiculous, let's get rid of it. The faculty said, let's double down. Let's increase the bonus factor to it. And I'm happy to report over five years now, they've been at zero. So we know that you could get to zero or get really close to it if you put these standard operating procedures or evidence-based practices, or we call them actual patient safety solutions at, at our foundation, you can get there. So that's, I think, maybe the message of hope that just put them in place and measure before and after and see what happens. Great. That's a fantastic story and, and uh, a great example for us, uh, Joe, to, 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 to move on from. Um, our time is up. Uh, it's amazing how quickly uh, 45 or even 50 minutes goes um, when, when you're listening um, uh, and I was always taught to, to take every opportunity you can to learn something every day. So uh, listening to you three, I've learned a lot uh, today. Uh, and so thank you for that. Um, it's also been very entertaining. So thank you for that. And I hope that uh, all of you are at the summit who are listening uh, to our conversation will, will take away some, some uh, the messages uh, that we've discussed, but also that it gives you confidence that you're doing the right thing and uh, that there, is, there are lots of opportunities for, for help um, uh, from different avenues and, and different um, uh, individuals. So may I thank uh, uh, Liam, Jeremy, Joe, um, uh, and also uh, I have to say in the background, Isabel, who's managing the recording for this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, interview or fireside chat. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for giving up your time uh, and thank you for your ongoing and continued commitment to help improve the safety of all our patients uh, and our healthcare workers. So thank you all very much. And I hope you have a very good and pleasant rest of the day, whichever, you, time, zone, whichever time zone you're in. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Mike. Nice to thank see you, you all. Bye-bye, everybody. Look forward to seeing you all again soon.